The more things change, the more they stay the same. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Do you ever, ever feel like that? You see things shifting and changing, things on repeat, yet there's a difference, but they're somehow the same. The more things change, the more they stay the same. It's an old quote penned by a French author in in 1849, and it's just as relevant today as it was when it was written. It makes me think of my my hometown of Longmont, Colorado, whenever we go back, which is once or twice a year. It feels somehow foreign after living away for a while, but then I'm like, no, this is my hometown. You know, the, the city's changed a little bit. The stores are different. The old mall has been replaced. And, and uh, you drive through the city streets and it looks a little different, but it's the same. It's my hometown. The more things change, the more they stay the same. What does this phrase mean? Well, it, it means that despite apparent changes and transformations and alterations, fundamental aspects of things remain constant. There is a nature to things. And maybe the sentence is a little bit on the cynical side, uh, but it does communicate a key truth, that there are core issues. There are underlying patterns that remain at the heart of things, while there are all sorts of societal and personal changes that are going on around them. So today, we begin a sermon series in the ancient books of 1st and 2nd Kings. And, And as we'll see, these ancient books that are full of uh, strange and some really captivating stories. They could not be more relevant to and map over the conditions of our world today better than they do. A world of social fragmentation, a world of religious corruption, of real politic, of power games, of human ambitions and power grabs and polarizations and divisions among party lines, injustice, all of these things. And in general, a sidelining of God in favor of things that can never satisfy. So, though this series is is not a series about the election season that we are in, that we are getting deeper into, it's no coincidence that we are in 1st and 2nd Kings as we go into this season. And I believe it will be to the effect of keeping us grounded in the gospel, resolutely keeping our eyes on Jesus amidst all the tumult and all of the, all of the things that will be coming our way for sure. Now, I can imagine some of you are saying, aha, now I know why we have the color scheme for the series, right? It's blue and red. He's finally getting political. Yes or no? One of the two. Um, uh, if you are thinking that, you know, this is like party lines, red, red and blue, uh, no, you're, you're not quite, quite right. Actually, uh, the color scheme here is a nod to 3D glasses, right? Think of 3D glasses. You have one lens that's blue or cyan and another lens that, that is red. And what do 3D glasses do? What do those polarized, different colored lenses do? Well, they function to bring a blurry and flat image into three-dimensional clarity, They function to bring a blurry and flat image into three-dimensional clarity. And that's what we need. We need three-dimensional clarity in our world. We need three-dimensional clarity about the scriptures and and what they say and how to read them. See, the series is called Kings and Shadows, and the subtitle is How First and Second Kings Points Us to King Jesus. The text is three-dimensional. It's not flat. It's not just about the things that we see on the surface. It all works together to point to Jesus. All the scriptures point us to Jesus. And so the kings and the shadows of the true king are, are there in the text for us to see. So you can consider the series, by the way, part two of our David series in First and Second Samuel. This is a continuation. We're going to continue to see how all these characters and these scenes and these stories and these historic events point us to Jesus. Now in the series, we're going to journey through some well-known uh, stories, some beloved ones, some strange ones, honestly, some really hard to process uh, stories. And, and God willing, we'll learn how to see in the lives of Solomon and Jeroboam and Hezekiah and, and Elisha and Elijah and a bunch of other names that end in uh. We're going to see how they point us to Jesus, the ultimate king. So as we delve into these narratives of the divided kingdom, 
of an age of radical and rampant religious corruption, of political intrigue, and the reigns of faithful and unfaithful kings, we will uncover, I believe, timeless truths that will bolster us for the days ahead and the cultural chaos in which we inhabit. So this week, we're going to get an introduction into First and Second Kings to see um, the leadership baton pass from King David to King Solomon. And in this episode, we were actually taught how to read the rest of First and Second Kings. It's like a key that unlocks how to properly read the rest of the story. So we're going to do that. But again, as we go through the season, we're going to address cultural things as we need to in the months ahead. Um, and we're going to do it with ferocious and tenacious an unrelenting focus on Jesus. With me? Sound good? Okay, excellent. 16 weeks uh, we will be in this series. Let's get into it. So here's a little outlay of where we're going this morning. <clears throat> Context and overview of First and Second Kings. And then we're going to see Solomon and the shape of kings to come, how to actually read the, these books or this book. And then the structure and then the shape of the king to come. If that makes zero sense, it's okay. Hopefully it will here in a few brief moments. So that's where we're going. We're, we're going to begin with context and overview. If you're new to the scriptures, the scriptures are composed of, you could say, two main parts. Part one and part two. You have the Old Testament, you have the New Testament. The Old Testament is where you start at the beginning and then three quarters of everything that's to come is what we call the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew scriptures. It starts with creation and it leads to about 400 years before the birth of, of Jesus Christ. The remaining one quarter, 25% of the scriptures is what's called the New Testament. Where it begins there with the birth of Jesus and then goes into then the, the birth of, of the church. And so that's how it's, it's laid out. A um, couple things regarding Kings, First and Second Kings are books in the Old Testament. Now, First and Second Kings in, in the Jewish scriptures, it's actually one big book. So it's one narrative. So we're supposed to read them together as a cohesive whole. Um, and that book was just simply called the book of the book of Kings, Sefer Melakim, the book of Kings. And what is it a story of? Well, it's a story of the kingdom of Israel from King Solomon, and it goes to exile. It goes to Exile. So you're dealing roughly with the dates 970 BC to, to 586 BC. Now it's called kings, but prophets are on center stage as well. So there's kings and prophets that are, that are in the limelight. We'll have a lot of stories that are specifically just about the, the prophets. Now Israel, you'll see, will go through cycles of 42 kings over 464 years, a lot of ups and downs, uh, royal roller coasters of political intrigue. Likely it was written during exile to explain why the people were in exile. So we get a clue for that in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 7 through 8, if you're wondering. And it's a book of theological history. And that simply means it's, it's history, it's historical, but it's an accounting of history that has a theological aim. It's shaped to do something to us as a reader so that we see something about who God is. Now, where does the, the story sit? What's the backstory? Well, we need to get the backstory to really understand how to move forward. So this is kind of like the, the previously on, you know, as you watch a show, it says previously on. Well, this is the, the previously on section here for a moment. So go with me backwards, rewind to the beginning, God. God is the creator of all things. God is the king of all that exists, of all that is and ever will be. And this great king, this good king, this good gardener, he creates human beings to live in a loving relationship with him. And, and then how do they respond? Well, they go rogue, they rebel, they refuse to trust in him. And so sin enters. Sin, this disintegrating force that, that fragments the world, that fragments the soul, it fragments humanity from God and then from, from each other. And so at, then Adam and Eve are exiled east, east of Eden but not before God gives a promise that he will make all things right, that he will bring the story to this glorious conclusion. Somehow, all things will be made right, even though all things seem wrong. Fast forward much later to a guy named Abram. Now we're in the east. We're in a city called Ur, and 
God comes to this Abram and he blesses him and he's going to make promises to him and to, to his descendants that the world will be blessed through his, his family line. And so God leads Abram from the east back west, so to speak, back into the promised land, back into the garden land. Now, through all sorts of wild and wonderful circumstances, God cares for his people and they grow, but then he, he moves them down into Egypt to save them from a famine. And then they're there for a long time and the, they, they expand and, and they grow. And so what does God do? Well, um, God comes to rescue them because they have become enslaved under the, the tyranny of a new serpent, the tyranny of a, a pharaoh. So God redeems the people. He takes them out of slavery, out of the, that tyranny that they're in, and he redeems them. This is what's called the Exodus, and he does it through a redeemer. What's the redeemer's name? Moses, right? Through, through Moses. So Moses then brings them to Mount Sinai, and there Mount Sinai, uh, at Mount Sinai, God uh, weds himself to his people. He gives them the Ten Commandments. He makes a covenant with them. And he teaches them how to live. He says, I've rescued you. I've redeemed you. I've saved you. Now live in light of this. And here's how you live in accordance with reality, the way I designed the world and, and who I am, this, this God, this God of love and holiness and, and justice and righteousness. Here's how you live in accordance. First I saved you. Now you learn to live in accordance. You don't earn it. It's been given. Now you live in light of it. He gives them this covenant. Covenant. Uh, in this covenant, he spells out blessings and cursings. Uh, blessings are those, those promises that if they follow his ways and they live in accordance with who he is, it's going to go well with them. And those curses are if you don't listen to this God and you go against the grain of it all, it's going to hurt and it's going to go badly for you and you're not going to flourish. Well, eventually God leads these people into the land of promise a few decades later through another leader. His name is Joshua. So now the people are in the promised land and then Joshua dies. And so God sends a series of what are called judges to lead the people, to be their rescuers and redeemers in the midst of a bunch of difficult situations when their enemies are coming, coming at them. He raises up a prophet, uh, a prophet and a judge named Samuel. Samuel hears from the people, and the people say, we want to be like the other nations. Give us a king. Give us a king. Which is interesting because God drew them out so they would not be like the other nations, so they would be a light on a hill. And by the way, they had a king to lead them into battle. They had a king who saved them and who redeemed them and who went before them and who took care of them. He's like, what am I? Am I not your king? Yet he gives them a king. He gives them a king. And before he does, Samuel warns them of some of the downsides. He's like, hey, look, here's how it's going to go when you get a king. The king's going to take your sons, and he's going to put them in battalions, and he's going to put them in his army. And the king's going to take your daughters for his service. Your king is going to take your fields and your vineyards. And then your king is going to do something I guarantee you're absolutely going to love. It's called taxation. You're going to dig it, I promise you. And then he says he'll take your servants and your animals to work for you. So then they choose the king, the people choose the king, rather than listening to the king that God want, wants for them. And, and so they pick this tall, charismatic, handsome guy named Saul. And it starts out really well with Saul, but it doesn't go well afterwards. Disobedience causes all sorts of issues, and God's presence leaves Saul because of his disobedience. That brings us to the shepherd king. What's his name? King, king David, right? A, a deeply God-fearing, loving king. God's presence is with him. He's a man after God's own heart. He commits all sorts of problematic things and sins, but, but ultimately he says, Lord, I need I need you. And he extends the boundaries, the borders, and he is, is the, the, the king, the great king of God's people. Well, he's going to leave his, king, his kingdom or the, the kingdom of God to a son, and that son's name is Solomon. And that's where our story picks up. David's dying. He's an old man, and he's on his deathbed. 
There's some uh, political intrigue that goes on with the sons because there's a few sons. One of them tries to steal the throne, but ultimately the throne goes to King Solomon. And here in our text, we get the leadership baton passed from David to Solomon, and we learn how to read the rest of Kings. So let me reread the text to get it in our heads, and it'll make a little more sense now. Chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon, his son, saying, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. I'm going to die. We all die. It's my time. Be strong. Show yourself a man. Keep your garden. Do what you need to do. And keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me, God had promised David that a member of his household would reign forever on the throne. Saying, if, you're, if your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Okay, so these are legacy words, right? David is about to die. These are, listen, my son, kind of words. And here he teaches Solomon what a good king is, is to be like. He teaches, teaches him and the reader the measure of a king. And from this point on throughout the rest of the books, we're going to measure the kings by what has been said here. So this is the measure of a king's, uh, the measure of the kings to come. Now, um, Solomon and the shape of the kings to come. This is a lesson in reading first and second kings. Here's the qualification. So one, he says, be strong, courageous. This is not going to be easy. You're going to go into the fray. Be a man. Take responsibility. Don't be, don't have this victimhood mentality. Enter in. Guard your garden. Step up. And then he uses seven phrases that essentially are summarized in trust God. Seven phrases. He says, keep the charge of the Lord your God. Walk in his ways. Keep his statutes. Keep his commandments. His rules, his testimonies, as it is written in the Torah, so you may prosper. Seven times. Like, uh, he's like, do you get it? Like, this is the thing. Trust the word of God. So the number one job description of the king is to trust in the greater king. A godly king knows he is a king under God. And he is to listen to to God above all other voices. And, and you could take this as a, a broader application. A godly leader, whatever their position, is a leader who knows that they are under God's leadership. They operate. They understand that they are not the alpha and the omega, that they are a servant and it is under God you know, that we lead from. And if, if that is not in the equation, it goes bad real fast. And people are hurt and steps on in the process. So David says, if this is the way of your reign, this radical trust in God, then there will always be a son of David on the throne. So again, here is, is the measure. Here's how we evaluate, evaluate the kings that will come. Do they listen to God's word? Do they place radical trust in God or not? Do they listen to some other voice? So how does Solomon do? How is this going to go? Is he this kind of king? Will he be a godly king? Will he be the long-awaited Messiah, the, the true son of God, who m- cleans up the mess that happened at the beginning? Well, he has great promise. He has great promise. It starts out well. It is literally a land of opportunity, but cracks in Solomon start to be seen early on in the story. And And in order to really understand what comes next, we need to read a very important passage. It's from the book called Deuteronomy. It's the fifth book in the Bible. It's an important verse. It's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 through 20. And uh, these are the words of Moses. Moses is a prophet. And and so he he says, look, you're going to get into the promised land. I know this. And you are going to ask for a king. And because you will ask for a king, here's how that king should operate. And then he says these following words. I'll pick up at verse 14. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me like all the other nations that are around me. Like 
I want to be like the cool kids in school. I want, to, I want to be with everyone else. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. So this, this is simple. It's going to happen, uh, but the king is to be someone from the tribes. They, they are to be uh, an Israelite. He goes on verse 16 and 17. He says, Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Okay, so here we have the don'ts. Here's the kingly no-nos. Like, this is not supposed to happen. Don't amass war horses. God is not anti-equestrian. This is, this is the command to not trust in physical power and physical force. And we so readily do that. He says, don't acquire many wives for yourself. And this is not simply uh, about sex or lust. This is trust in political alliances and real politics. Because in his day, in his age, when you would marry a princess from another land, from another country, what would you do? You would create an alliance. You would extend and strengthen your power base. He's saying do not take a sacred institution that is designed for the benefit of man and women to treat them both as human beings, as image bearers of God that then shows the beauty of who God is. Do not take that institution and use it for your broken power gain. This is not how you become a king, by, by creating alliances and finding your security in alliances through your manipulation, through something beautiful and sacred. Do not do it. And then he says, don't amass wealth. Don't trust in material resources and riches. They make terrible saviors. So those are the don'ts. Then he gives him some do's. And I'll read this from verse 18 and 20 here in just a moment. But here are the do's. Get a personal copy of God's word. Put it on your bedstand. Meditate on God's word daily. Eat it. Metabolize it. Live by God's word. Live in accordance with what God says about reality. Why? So that the king doesn't grow proud, self-exaltant, so power doesn't corrupt him, and he doesn't commit evil, but that he might live in accordance with the true king and reign and rule in love and goodness. Verses 18 through 20 spell that out. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law. He needs to have his own one right there with him, not just in the temple. Approved by the Levitical priest. He can't edit it. He can't go all Thomas Jefferson on it. Like this needs to be the the, the legit version. And it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord, his God, by keeping all the words. So not just to think about it, but to get it in him, to keep it, to walk in accordance with it. And he says, doing them, right? Doing these words. That his heart may not be lifted up over his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Trusting God's word leads to life. Lack of trust in the goodness of God and lack of listening to his word leads to what? Death. Will there be a king like this? Will there? Will there be a king like this? That's, that's the question. Will Solomon be the king like this? If you're just reading the story from the start, you never read the Bible, you read this, then you get to Solomon and David's commands to Solomon, the question would be like, is this is Solomon the guy? Is he going to do this? Will he not do those don'ts and will he do those do's? How's it go for Solomon. <laughs> Our laughter betrays us, right? <clears throat> How does it go for Solomon? He gathers excessive horses and chariots. 1 Kings 10, 26. Not only that, he gathers horses from Egypt. 1 Kings 10, 28. He's not reading the book on his bedstand, is he? He accumulates gold and silver to such a staggering degree that silver becomes considered as common as stone. In one year, he gathers 50,000 pounds of gold. He exceeds all other kings in their, their wealth race and pursuit. 
Everything in his house is made of gold. His throne is gold. There's, there's gold shields on the walls. There's gold tables. There's gold toilets. There's gold iPhones. Everything is just gold. It's everywhere. He acquires 700 royal wives and 300 concubines. This is politics and sex. 700. In, in the scripture it says royal or princesses. He's married them to create this power base, to build his kingdom and create a social, institutional, alliance kind of security around him. How's it going for Solomon? Not so good. In worldly eyes, he's, he's killing it. But in the eyes and the metrics of what it means to be a good godly king, he's just F, 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 like all the way across the board. So the story of Solomon teaches us the shape of things to come. Now, he's wise, and God grants him wisdom, and his story is way more complex than I'm making it out. Um, and God uses him and does wonderful things. But that wisdom that he has isn't even enough. He needs a Savior. The story of Solomon teaches us the shape of things to come. How? Solomon is, is an archetype. He's a pattern. He's given a garden situation where things are flourishing. He's put in the middle of it to listen to God's word, to extend the borders of that kingdom all over the world for the blessing of humanity. He, he, if anyone is going to succeed, it's going to be this guy. And he doesn't. All the other kings, they too will go the way of Solomon. They will fail and they will fall. They will trust in various degrees and various ways in all of these these idols, these false gods and war horses, worldly strength and political alliances, trust in human institutions and man-made power bases and wealth, money and resources. The kings that will read will, will trust in these things in various ways, degrees and ratios. And they will turn the things of creation into the creator and it will not go well for them. Solomon will sin, and sin leads to death. The kings that follow will take us further down that disintegration, rebellion spiral, and the kingdom will split apart. The the, the very next generation, his son is such a knucklehead and, and so proud that he splits the kingdom. He splits the kingdom because of his his pride. And it leads to a civil war. And then we just see this painful list of kings failing to be godly kings with some flawed um, yet also wonderful exceptions in the mix. So, back to our outlay for this morning, just so we can gain our bearings. Context and overview. We've done a little little bit of that. Solomon and the shape of kings to come. He's taught us how, the story has taught us how to read and evaluate the rest of the kings that are to come. Now, for for this, the structure and the shape of the king to come. Um, Oh, it says kings, but the the, the king to come. Um, This points us to Jesus. See, look, Israel is set in the garden-like promised land. And when I say Israel, I mean the people, the people of God. Israel is known as God's son. The scriptures in a number of places say that Israel, God's people, uh, are God's son. So he says, out of Egypt I called my son, right? So Israel is God's son, the child of his inheritance. In Exodus 4.22, God declares that Israel is my firstborn son. So God's calling his people his, his firstborn son. 2 Samuel 7 tells us that the king shall be to God as a son. So now we have a conflation, a mixing of the, the nation of Israel and the king. And, and the king as the representative is the son of God. Why is this important? Israel, like Adam and Eve, failed to trust God's word of blessing. The kings of Israel, and therefore Israel the nation, which are bound up together, they fall and they fail. As it goes with the king, so it goes with the nation. Israel must die. The nation must die. So by the end of the book, Israel goes into death. What's that death called? Exile. They go into the death of exile. They're hauled off in chains, again, to the east, just like east of the garden. They're hauled off to the east in chains by Babylon. But How's this going to work out? Because God has promised that he will bless the world through them and that, that they will never fully be gone, that they, they will rise somehow. So how's this, how's this going to happen? Well, you get to the very end of Kings. You just follow the, the, the tragic dark spiral to the end of Kings. So you go to 2 Kings, and I want to read a portion of it. Uh, you get to this guy. Uh, he's got, got a great, great name, Evil Merodach. 
evil Merodach, okay? Uh, and we get to this passage here, and here's, here's what it says. This is the end of the story. So, spoiler alert, sorry. 2 Kings 25, verses 28 through 29. And he, the king of Babylon, this evil Merodach, uh, he spoke kindly to him. Who's the him? We haven't met him yet, but his name is Jehoiachin. And he is one of the remaining uh, royal heirs. So he's, he should be king on throne in Israel. He's not. He's in prison in Babylon. But it says this Babylonian king lifts this Jehoiachin up. He gives him a seat above the seats of kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin put off his prison garments. And then the book's like, done. It's like, dot, dot, dot. What? Come on, the Bible's weird sometimes. This is so wonderful because we spiral into the pit. We are down in the deepest place of death and then we get this slant of light, of hope. There is a king of the royal line and he was just plucked out of prison and he was just put at the king's table and now there's an ascension. Okay, I... Are you seeing these pieces? So, so let me consolidate it for you. In the book of Kings, there is a garden, a garden start, a glorious garden start. Then there is a sin spiral into destruction, which leads to national death and exile, which then will rise again to a future resurrection. So, Hear me when I say this. Israel, God's son, must die and then rise again. Israel is called God's son. God's son must die because of sin and goes into death and then rises again and the royal seed rises. You see it? You, you see who I'm getting to here, right? First and Second Kings is a book that points us to the death of God's beloved son, this is, this is Jesus, the overall structure of First and Second Kings at the macro level speaks of the Son of God who is the true king who must die because of the sin of his people and then rise again to save his people. That's Jesus. That's the story of the Bible. Garden, east, exile, bring the people back by his grace, teaching them how to live as his apprentices. That is the life of Jesus. He enters in and he goes into his agony before he can go up into his glory. And it's the structure of kings. God can write that story. No human being can weave these scriptures in such a way. And so that brings me to this. What do we do with these things? Besides go, huh, oh, that's some cool history and great theology, fun. What do we do with this? One, like, first, we pause in awe at the glorious integration of, of the, the nature of scriptures. And we praise God for his word. We praise him for his word. What is his word? What is the Bible? It's, it's the God-breathed, humanity-pinned, story-shaped library that leads to encountering Jesus, our only hope, the faithful king. That's what the scripture is. It's incredible. And so we, we meditate on it. We spend time trusting in what he said. And we thank him that he has revealed himself to us in such a beautiful and brilliant way. Second, we identify our kingdom disintegrating idols. We identify our kingdom disintegrating idols, our misplaced trust, and we turn then to Jesus. What are we trusting in? We need to identify our war horses and our wedding parties being wed to political parties. You get it? Okay. Wealth amassing. Like, we need to identify these things. Let me, let me explain these things before I get five emails about politics before the sermon's over. Uh, <clears throat> what are your war horses? What are your war horses? Look, I don't know too many people who are, are buying chariots and horses and putting them in their, their garage. One reason is because they can't fit them in their garage because their garage is full of stuff because in California there's no basements so you can't even park your cars in the garage. So all our cars are out on the driveway. I digress. <laughs> A lot. We're, we're not buying war chariots. But I do know many people who are always ready 
for a fight. They are ready to get into it, to fight somebody into submission, to use some kind of power in their life to coerce somebody into their own kingdom. Do you place your trust in human might, coercion, force, or intimidation? What are your war horses? Two, wedding parties. Where have you married the political? Placing your hope in human institutions and alliances. Are you more passionate about the rise of some party platform than the rising of Jesus from the dead? Are you more willing to talk about a candidate than King Jesus? Like we, have, we need to be curious about these things because during this time, we will find ourselves readily talking about a candidate to somebody at Trader Joe's or Costco and then we talk about talking to them about Jesus and go, I would never talk with them about Jesus. But you will about a candidate. Why? I just, why? Let's be curious about these things. Why are we more willing to talk about a temporal candidate than an eternal king? I don't understand. Well, I do, because I'm in it too. Are you more passionate about the election this season than the fact that God has elected you to life through the ministry of Jesus? Let me caveat. (laughs) Let me caveat, because I've heard this before. Like, you don't care about politics. We care. We care deeply because what happens to our world and and our nations and our families and our neighbors, it's for us to care. And we are to deeply engage. I, we care. What happens on the stage of the world nationally and globally, it's important, but it's not ultimate. And we flip those. What am I saying? I'm saying that we are a lot more like Solomon than we realize, and we spend great energies and resources and passions on war horses and marrying politics. Do not marry politics. You will be a widower. Befriend politics. Marry the king. Are we first and most aligned with Jesus than a party or a platform? Do we find ourselves, some diagnostics, do we find ourselves more agitated and frustrated about the topic of politics than somebody misusing the name of Jesus? Or or, or not understanding the gospel? Why does one get us and the other we're like, eh, I'm fine? Do you find yourself super kind, easy to get along with? You're you're a two on the Enneagram or whatever the test is, and you're like the nicest person on earth, and you never get mad unless it comes to politics and then your claws come out. What? Why? Get curious. Assess that impulse. What's disordered in your affections? Do you find you spend more time giving your attention to political pundits and thinking through debates more than you find yourself meditating on God's word? The American Psychology uh, Association gave these stats. So in 2016, 23% of families were, were riven, were broken apart by the major forms of stress that came from politics. That's 2016. 2022, 37% of families had, had politics as a major stressor in their family life. 2023, 39%. 2024, what's the current calculation? 41% and growing. Friends, one in six family members are no longer talking to each other because of political affiliation. I wonder what the not talking because of married to politics ratio is within our church family. In 2023, 40% of congregations spoke of deep internal conflicts that tore apart community. We're not not just a political people. We are a hyper-political people. You can fact check this. This was from ChatGPT. I looked it up on the way way here while I was driving here. (laughs) What is the meaning of hyper-politics, ChatGPT? Hyperpolitics generally refers to an extreme or highly intensified form of political activity, discourse, or engagement. It can describe situations where political issues are debated with unusual high intensity, where politics permeates all aspects of life, or where political concerns dominate public and private spheres. 
Hyperpolitics often involves heightened polarization, sensationalism, or extreme partisanship. The term is used to capture the sense that political considerations are magnified and may overshadow other aspects of society and personal life. I have friends who are teachers who are telling me a constant conversation between their second graders and third graders is which candidate will win. Hyper politics, deification of human beings and the institutions they create and we as Christians so readily fall into it and sideline Jesus and shop out salvation to someone else. You probably want me to move on. I should probably move on. The clock says move on. Wealth amassing. How are you trusting in wealth? Physical resources treated like saviors. Are we like Solomon amassing wealth because we will be okay if we just have this around us? And I think here of the kings who, according to Moses, were to have have the, the word with them, right? To meditate on it day day and night. And then I think about us living here in the Bay Area, which is frenetic and, and frenzied, and we're just trying to keep up with the Joneses and trying to pay our bills, but also trying to get bigger and, and better things. What are we sacrificing to maintain our quality of life or to increase our quality of life? How often does the incredible gift of having God's word to meditate on get backseat to us striving after more and more riches or to maintain a lifestyle we shouldn't even be living? I can hear it uh, because it's in me. Well, I'm just being practical. I'm just being practical. I got to do these things. And and look, it's the same voice that that, that bleeds through the broken kings of the first and second kings. And it goes like this. Hey, it's hard to run a kingdom. It's hard to run a kingdom. I need to gather more and more resources. I, I need more and more financial security to take care of my people. I don't have the time nor the energy to put my nose in the scriptures. That's your job. First and Second Kings teaches us over and over and over again. There is nothing more practical and beneficial than devoting our energies to trusting God's voice over all other voices and being in his word. Friends, the voices of worldly power, the neighing, the voices of war horses, the voices of seductive political alliances that keep calling us to get into bed with them and compromise what it means to follow Jesus as his apprentice. The voices of silver and gold and portfolios and and 401ks, they all call, they siren sing to us, they pull on us, but we are a people who are to listen to the word of God above all other voices, to listen to the word of the king who did not fail. He is the king who did not fail. He is the king who did not collect war horses. He did not coerce and swing a sword, but fought sin and death and destruction by giving himself and dying sacrificially on a cross. He is the king who did not fail. He did not form political alliances. He did not play the power games of the Sadducees. They were the political power brokers. They kept drawing him into these kind of conversations. And he said, I'm good. Let me give a parable and talk about a sower and seed. Let me love this woman who hasn't seen love in years because of your broken system. He's the king who did not fail, the king who did not go about gathering silver and gold, but gave away his divine resources so that the humans, the broken humans of this earth could 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 become the children of God. He gave it all away. Jesus is the one who faithfully fulfilled the law of the kings found in Deuteronomy 17 and he is the one that all the broken achingness of first and second kings points us to and the more things change the more they stay the same but not with Jesus because when he came he so significantly changed things that we no longer have to be the same because he died in our place and has given us his spirit and now we can live like him by his grace. Father, you are good. (laughs) You are good. We love you, Lord. Would you use these many words to bring clarity, a three-dimensional clarity to the chaos within the world and to the chaos within our souls. Help us to give the first seat to Jesus over everybody else. Lord, we love you. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.